Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Dan Curhan. Dan is a mechanical engineer uh, who is currently working on some really cool stuff that I don't know how much I'm allowed to say about. <laughs> I don't know how much I'm allowed to say about it either, so uh, we're going to keep it vague. <laughs> Sweet. Uh, but working in biotech. On One a, of my favorite new... fields to work in. Oh, yeah, new stuff. <clears throat> Badass. My first time in biotech. Uh, so learning a lot about molecular biology, um, but still doing still doing mechanical engineering. That's awesome. Yeah, I love uh, biomedical engineering. That's probably my favorite field. I haven't done anything with molecular biology, but um, like building those biomed robots. What's that? It's a rabbit hole. The learning curve is really steep. Well, that's awesome. All right, so. Not to distract because that's interesting, but I think we're going to do an on camera actually talking about our whiskey tasting just to make this episode different. So I'm drinking uh, the Kinsey American whiskey from Philadelphia. Solid choice. This was gifted to me. This is the Shin, it's a 15 year Japanese whiskey. Nice. Mine is a four year. Nice. I think I'm the plebeian here. <laughs> you like what you like drink what you drink cheers that's quite good yeah good time yeah I'll have to bring a bottle of this out next time I visit you um, just cause like it's it's the cool Pennsylvania thing to bring with I think at this point <laughs> Kinsey. I've never had it, so that's fair. It's quite good. It. It's it's a very tasty whiskey. I recommend against their rye, but the American whiskey, surprisingly, is like very, very good. Normally I love a rye, but <clears throat> the rye is a little bit gross. Um I I gave away a bottle of their bourbon, so I don't know that I've tried it yet. But the American whiskey, no, maybe I drank it with somebody and I just blacked out that night and don't remember it. <laughs> that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I might have drank it with uh, somebody uh, that I used to work with at SpaceX. And um, we just had a lot to drink that night. And by the time we got to that, I think we were just blasted. And so I just don't remember what it tasted like. So the bourbon may or may not be good. <laughs> Fair enough. The American whiskey Fair is enough. great. <laughs> I'll have to try to shin one of these days. <clears throat> Japanese is always light and smooth. Good yeah, stuff. I'm a big. Well, this is like that too, to be honest. It's it's like very. Um, it goes down easy. It's like slightly smoky, like oaky, but not really super much. On the thing, it said used Scotch barrels. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's four years. So it's pretty pretty young. <laughs> If they make it drinkable, that's a that's a bit of a feat for a four year a four year whiskey, right? Yeah, it, I mean it's smooth. It just doesn't have a whole lot of like undertones going on. So, uh, I like it. <laughs> that's all that matters. Undertones like are for uh, <laughs> under folks. I don't know. Is that a <laughs> is that a new catchphrase? I don't think so. I don't have that. I don't have that money. I'm not rich enough to afford undertones in my whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she's an undertone, right? <clears throat> yeah, for, make just, some hot toddies. I'm just oh, drinking yeah. around. Hot toddies are good. I, I was drinking hot toddies before this. So anyway, um, now that I've let on that I'm a totally degenerate alcoholic, which everyone who watches this already knows. <laughs> um, <laughs> what what are some of the things you've been learning about molecular biology? Um, I mean, obviously the extent you can talk about, but just the subject matter. Sure. Practice. <clears throat> so one of the applications of what we are doing is uh, genomic sequencing. Um, and cool. to, to give a, a tiny bit of background, uh, I'm, I'm working for a startup company that um, has yet to really announce a lot about what it's doing. But the, the broad stroke is that we're doing sample preparation for genomic sequencing. So that includes... Uh, extraction and library preparation of DNAs, uh, as well as you know some other in-between steps that are that are helpful. 
Sweet. So, yeah, so that led me down a rabbit hole of, okay, well, if we are serving customers that do a lot of genetics and genomics work, I should probably understand what they do so that I can build or, you know, contribute to the best instrument that I can. And this was a new word for me, uh, going from machine to product to instrument. Instrument is what we were building. Interesting. <laughs> that was, that was a, instrument a, testing. A, Interesting. Right. So as, as a, as a musician, right. Uh, <laughs> instrument to me is like guitars, <laughs> yep. but you know, by the way, your version um, of Britney Spears toxic is one of my favorite things in the world to this day. That will never leave, <laughs> never, <laughs> never be published to the internet. <laughs> that was, that was college flirtation with danger. Uh, actually, no, I, I wooed, you... I wooed my now fiance playing that to be fair. Nice. So, uh, that's... <laughs> you wooed me playing that. I mean, I was like, so did it work? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know. Only in a platonic way, but it still made me very happy. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't played that in a long time. Yeah. But in any case, so we are we are building an instrument that, uh, like I said, does sample preparation for for genomic sequencing. Um, and so I wanted you know to dive in, and it turns out it's it, it's just a rabbit hole. Like every bit that I learned, essentially taught me that there is. A lot more to learn. Cool. So I started kind of with the basics, with the um, you know the the transcription process, uh, and went from there and dug into what each of the molecules does. Um, some details on like you know different mechanisms and enzymes, and understanding sequencing where the technology is today, who the major players are, how it's done, what it achieves, what it tells us. Um, it, it was really like I spent probably a week just diving in and, and researching all the things that I heard around me at work but didn't yet understand. Awesome. It's been fun. Yeah, that's really cool. I, I did that recently with... Um anodizing at work I, I learned a bunch about that um and i learned enough to know that i know nothing about anodizing like i i there are much smarter people about me than me about it in the world they're much better experts uh and i'm i'm an idiot and so i i say this i'm also now the company's expert in anodizing because <laughs> of learning about it exactly um, yep. No, actually, I'm not because I just hired a guy that was a technologist for Arconic for 30 years. So he is the company's expert in analyzing. Oh, very good. And I am the idiot well. that I belong. I'm the second expert. <laughs> <laughs> His knowledge becomes your knowledge at some point. Some uh, of it anyway. It, 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 I mean, he's taught me a few things, but he is he knows way more than I do. You know where to get the information at least. Yeah, yeah for sure. I know enough to know to bring in people smarter than me. Pro tip. Yep. Yeah, for those listening, uh, <laughs> bring in people smarter than you because you don't know that much. Being being humble about what you don't know is, is really, really important. Um, so that was kind of a key part of uh, taking on this new role was you know, coming in with my background in robotics and uh, automation, custom machine design, and a, a little bit of product development. Um, I was probably the least bio-educated person at the entire company <laughs> when I joined. So, uh, yeah, big, big shoes to fill, it feels. <clears throat> so, Brutal. I'm reminded... I'm reminded constantly that, like, you know, I have I have a lot more to learn, and being in an in an environment like that only really just encourages you to to learn and to admit what you don't know. I mean, that's kind of great, though, isn't it? Like, I feel like that's much better than the alternative, which is feeling as though you've plateaued. And I don't know, like, if I 
I think if I stopped learning things, I would just quit. <laughs> like, I don't know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to do it no more. Yep. I I uh, I maintain that there are two core requirements to staying in a job. You need to be learning things. And you need to be having fun. And if either of those two is not true, then it's probably time to think about something else, some, some kind of change. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I like that money doesn't enter into it with that model. It uh, can't. I mean, you're going to be miserable um, <clears throat> if you're if you're chasing money and you're dissatisfied. I mean, some people like, seem to do that, where where like they're they do a job that probably sucks. I mean, like, I don't know. I mean, you see this, I think, with... I don't want to single out a profession, but I guess it's not a person. It's a profession. Like, banker, investment bankers or management consultants. Like, you know, they, it just seems to be a paper chase, right? And mm. at the end of the day, I mean, you know, you've got a Coke habit and maybe you're not that fulfilled with what you're doing. So I, I don't know. I mean, obviously that's not true across the board. I mean, there are probably people that manage to make those jobs interesting, but that's the stereotype. <laughs> it is very much the same. I knew that was coming before you even said it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, or you have an aneurysm by the time you're 40, right? And then that's the end of you. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Try to avoid the stress. Avoid yeah. the stress. I mean, I, I don't know. On one hand, I feel like some some types of stress can be kind of fun. So um, when I'm doing an engineering project where I don't exactly have the skills to do it um, and it's pretty stressful, but then I can overcome that stress and do a good job, that's kind of feels like a like a sort of win. Um, Absolutely. And, and stress is like the antagonist that you've got to overcome to get that win. So maybe... In that sense, there is no growth without discomfort. Yeah, overcoming stress is uh, overcoming discomfort, and hopefully, you come out the other side stronger. Yeah, for sure. The, there have been plenty of projects like that where I, I, I mean, it was definitely a boost in the end, but a uh, roller coaster in the interim. <laughs> so, yeah, I think, I think you've One been the there for some of <laughs> Yeah, right. Uh, it's been a it's been a lot of years. Uh, what happens in a lot of years? I'm under that. One of the things that we do at work that I really enjoy, and and this maybe not be scalable. We are we are a company of about 25 people now. Oh, cool. Um, so really, really small startup. Um, but one of the things that we do is every week we go around the entire company around to every person and everybody talks about one of uh, something that they consider a win for the week, something that they really are like proud of that not, might not get otherwise recognized. And they talk about a whoops for the week, something that was nice. a, a mistake or a failure or something that went wrong. I really like that. <clears throat> it fosters, a really like inclusive and psychologically safe place to try things and fail and grow from it um, in in a really supportive environment. So, That's sweet. I like it too. Yeah, no, I think I think that should be common practice, and I, I kind of wish that. That's the first I've heard of that, right? And I feel like it shouldn't be. So mm. yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, there's there's really really thoughtful leadership at this company um I, I admire them greatly so i'm really really stoked that's great yeah that's that's awesome i'm just thinking of that uh that name you told me before we go it. Uh, that's why i'm giggling yeah but uh no it seems it seems like good good folks <laughs> we've uh we've renamed uh one of our founding employees with a, a fun a, a fun take on his name. <laughs> um yeah, it's it's good. <laughs> it won't it won't won't be publicized, but it's Yeah, I don't fun. think we should. It's no. It's it's a good team. They're all they're all really good people. 
Yep. Yep. For sure. No, I mean, it, it seems awesome. I'm glad you're happy there. And, um, yeah, man, it's just, it's just good to see, see you grow. I, I'm growing too. And, uh, yeah, I hope I'm that, into that. I hope that never stops. Uh, maybe it's senility. <laughs> <In the meantime. laughs> you peak and then start going back down well like tom lara had this yeah. quote uh you know the guy that makes like uh songs about math and all sorts of stuff from like the 60s um and he had this quote where he's like my life is an experiment i'm gonna butcher this but he said to um prolong adolescence bypass maturity and shoot straight to senility <laughs> Solid. I thought it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> if you can make that work, it's a way to be. That sounds. I funny. feel like I've done that, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, you reached senility? No, no, no. I'm just point? prolonging adolescence. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah. Trying to my, trying my to bypass uncle. maturity. <laughs> right. You got to skirt right past it. Don't even get close. Yeah. When I was a. Uh probably 16 or 17 late high school my uncle told me uh that when you're 25 26 that's about the mindset that you keep with you for the rest of your life that's interesting because i was a real scumbag at that age <laughs> no, i'm kidding i wasn't a scumbag but i mean i was i was definitely degenerate so we all grow we all grow but yeah. somewhere inside you is that like no, I'm raging 26 year old <laughs> causing problems and stirring shit up right i mean i, mean, I have professional integrity <laughs> and I, I like to think i'm good at my job and you know I, if i say i'm going to do something i do it you know and i mean it means a lot to me to deliver results for those who trust me to do so but at the same time mm -hmm. like i love a good poop joke and <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't think i ever want to stop you know just kind of taking the piss because it's fun yep we uh we had a moment at work today where do was said twice in a row <laughs> by several people in a row it doesn't leave we're That's all awesome. giant children inside yeah, for sure. I, I had my buddy Eli Wegman on the podcast a while ago. Um, he runs a design firm and he's got some interesting life philosophies. Like, I, I guess he's a Buddhist um, and he was talking a lot about that, you know, and him and I had quite a few drinks. So we, we had we got real philosophical when, when we did this. But one of the things he said that I really liked is, you know, we're all just kids on a playground, and you know, <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. it's just kids on a playground wearing suits. So, I think that's pretty true. It is. Yeah. And when your toys, when your playground toys are like cool equipment and <laughs> fun stuff, like we, we just, just have a different. Moved in fifteen million dollars in machine tools at Form Logic. Yeah, right. <laughs> different, oh, different set of toys, right? Yep. Well, yeah, I told you I was like flying around in a prop plane today. <laughs> different facilities mm -hmm. i won't say what facilities but uh yeah i mean different set of toys for sure yep yep, yep. Yeah. yeah we are mm, potentially moving at the end of the year nice. and there's talk of either staying within an incubator space that'll provide us a machine shop and all those fun tools or going into our own space and buying them ourselves and right now, there's not that many people who can maintain all that equipment. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it's it's certainly a skill to to keep up with a suite of of machines like that. Yeah, I mean, it, it it's definitely gotten the better of us on more than one occasion. I mean, I remember we got some. Um, do you, are you familiar with the brand Grobe? Mm -hmm. So we got some Grobe uh, G three fifties. Um, so we got the 350T and then we got three of the 350As. And I, I, I might have the pricing wrong, but I think they're about three quarters of a million dollars each. Um, they're horizontal machining centers. They're popular in the automotive industry. Uh, they're dead nuts precise. Mm. Um, like I think like five micron tolerance or, or better. 
and uh, they're great. So they're, they're awesome machines. Uh, we really like them. But um, when we got them, uh, there was an oversight because, I mean, you know, you just have a lot of people trying to do a lot of stuff really fast. And, you know, we're all a little bit new to this. And somebody forgot to order um, the right hydraulic fluid or, and the right antifreeze um, and enough coolant to commission these machines. So the next day, um, me and one of the technicians went around to all the auto parts stores in the area and bought um, coolant for BMWs, or sorry, antifreeze for BMWs, because um, this is a German machine that uses the same antifreeze as a BMW. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, our CEO like personally went to like this chemical store and bought, you know, the whey oil. And then, um, you know, I think the um, the coolant we had from our other machine tool, so that we were okay on that. Um, but uh, you know, we got all the stuff in a day just by running around town. But uh, yeah, you know, I mean, it's kind of a learning experience. So never gonna, never gonna get caught with my pants down that way again. Yep, that's that's key. Is like, don't make the same mistake twice. Yeah, exactly. If you never made the same mistake twice, your your career is in good shape. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and there's people <clears throat> that I mean, their whole business is chemical management, right? And so, you know, it's what I was trying to get at is it's a lot of work to to take care of these machines. I mean, there are so many different things that can go wrong mm. and when it's on your critical path if you don't have like maintenance engineer looking after. Pardon me. Um you know, you could end up with a down tool that you need and then you're you're fucked. So Yeah. And then you know, even something as simple as like a three D printer. Like needs maintenance and upkeep and and attentiveness i spent a half hour 45 minutes a day cleaning up the communal form labs suite of tools uh that we have in our in our basement shop and uh it was really clear that like it hadn't been getting that kind of attentive maintenance and it scrape you know <laughs> cured resin out of the cure yeah, machine that was like causing the the carousel to do weird things and like no uh, it was it was a good time that form labs <laughs> goo <clears throat> yeah yeah That's so disgusting. realistically <laughs> like while i am very tempted to contribute meaningfully to buying the tools and building out a shop like we don't have the bandwidth to maintain a shop really well. Yeah. Like that's that's probably underappreciated bandwidth for uh oh for, for sure young companies. I mean, we have several people responsible for doing that in our operation and it's still, you know, I mean, stuff gets by us. So uh yeah. And I mean our focus is machining. <laughs> so I, I would say, I mean, you know, we're, we're doing, you know, better than our competitors still, but I, I would say it's, it's a daunting task. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's pretty right. wise, I think. Right. Right. I, um, I, it's funny cause I remember, you know, when you and I met, you were the shop master for the CMU Robotics club. So I know you know how to maintain a shop. <laughs> I've done but it a few times. Bandwidth is uh, it. after you. I'm sorry. Oh, you're good. I, I've done it several times. I've I've built out a, an engineering shop at my first job. I um, was not allowed into our fully staffed, fully maintained machine shop very often at my second job. Weird. Uh, my last job, I bought us a lathe and kind of contributed pretty heavily to the build out of our of our shop equipment and and maintenance of it. Um, so it's, it's certainly something I've done a few times. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, for sure. No, when you said not allowed, I'm just thinking of the uh, the union shop they had at Joy Global, where I wasn't supposed to be in there, but I would go in anyway. And mm -hmm. it was interesting because we were sending out parts for manufacturer externally quite a bit. Uh, I was in the advanced automation group, so that was responsible for making these four-story high mining vehicles into giant robots. 
And mm -hmm. um, as a result, you know, we we actually not as a result. In order to do that, we would we would test our work on miniatures of the uh, the giant robots, and then we deploy to the full scale vehicle in the field. Um, and then I want to say, um, you know, we, we you're making robots. You need custom parts. So we sent this all out to external machine shops. And when I came in, one of the things I started doing was going to our internal tool and die shop and having stuff made over there because it's right in the same building. You know, we can get it faster and, you know, off in the same day. And, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, it's the prices were weird. There was like monopoly money between the departments that didn't really make sense or actually get exchanged. But a lot yeah. of times what would happen is I would go in and I, um, you know, would ask for a part and then at first it would take forever and they, and, you know, they wouldn't really get to it for a while or like you could get a rush put on it, but it was, you know, like a special favor and a bunch of money billed to your department. But then, you know, I, I started making friends with them and alluding to the fact that I knew how to run machine tools. And after a while they would just let you make parts on their tools. And so you know, often as a young engineer at that point, I would just go and spend a little time machining when I need to blow off steam and make our parts yep. and bring them back to my department. And I would lie I and say that I had the, the machine order executed. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> yeah, I didn't I didn't pull any sketchy stuff to, to do it. I don't think but, it was that um, sketchy. I mean, I just oh man, <clears throat> wanted to do manual I, labor. It feels good to machine stuff. I mean, making stuff generally just feels good. It's it's not instant, but it's certainly gratification. It's it's a physical manifestation of your effort. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> well, I mean, I even like I'll, I'll go so far as to say like I even like to sweep the floor because I feel like it's um yeah, you know, just kind of clears your head. It gives you a chance to meditate, and you know, if yeah, you're constantly sure. working out the brain muscle, I mean, you don't really get that many chances to just give that a rest and, you know, work out your real muscles. So it's nice to kind of do yeah. both, I think. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of uh, really high profile, like company leaders that are often lauded for their uh, philosophy that like no one's above that kind of work and seeing company leadership sweeping floors can often have a big impact on, on like company culture. One of the things that made me want to work at FormLogic is that when I was visiting there as a consulting engineer before I, you know, got the job, I'll, I can talk about how I did that later if you're interested, um, is I uh, saw the CEO sweeping the floor and, you know, I just thought this is probably a down to earth place to work. Mm hmm. Did that prove true? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, you know, like anything, I mean, it's not without fault, but I mean, I'm, I'm happy there. You know, I, I enjoy my colleagues and uh, I work quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Dude, I learned that there is no time in life to be miserable. Like if you hate your job, there right. is very, <laughs> very likely a better one. Yep. <clears throat> So, yeah, it's, it, I, I know that, like, that's not necessarily a situation that you've been in, um, being largely in control of, of, of your own destiny. Thanks. Um, but having a, uh, having a really good work environment just makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, and I mean, there are moments when I have bad days, right, where I, I just feel like... Of course. You know, like this day sucked ass, and <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it's horrible. But then I don't know. I mean, like like the other day, I was having kind of a rough day, and I mean, I, I, I this is gonna sound kind of a little bit silly, but I, I just listened to Marcus Aurelius meditations, like the audiobook, and it just made me feel better. I'm like, you know. Uh, I, it's, Life's, yeah. I, life is what you choose to make of it, right? And so, absolutely, yeah, you, you can you can choose to be miserable and, and feel shitty and, you know, just 
get mad at, at little things that suck, or you can appreciate the good things, which are also very much apparent. And or you can do a little bit of both. Like I mean, there's <laughs> there's many shades of of experience, you know. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I only say this with the perspective of like being in a a a job that wasn't the best fit. Um, I my my skill set and background kind of clashed with the the ethos of my prior company. And uh, while like I learned a lot from that experience, and I probably wouldn't have done anything different uh, in terms of planning out my career. Um, you know the, the the contrast when you find a a role that's really fulfilling and a, and a company that's really supportive uh, and empowering is just you know invaluable. Like you can't put a <laughs> you can't put a price on that. Yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fun too. <laughs> so first, so I I'm our. Uh, I'm our mechatronics engineering lead, which uh, is kind of a complicated role at the moment. Um, because we're so small, I report directly into our, our co-founder and our head of engineering. Um, <clears throat> yeah, who I guess I'll say it. We have we have dubbed Billiam because uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can you can change William into Billiam. And it's just more fun. I don't think that's um, that bad. Billion was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, there's there's no one there's no other layer, um, and so I get pulled into both really high level conversations, and still I'm expected to do like engineering design work. And, you know, for me personally, that's that's really fulfilling because I like doing a little bit of everything. Uh, I like being creative and doing creative design work, and I like thinking about the future and, and kind of having a vision of what we're aiming at. And uh, that's awesome. I get to do both. Yeah, as uh, as the director of advanced projects at Formlogic, I'm still kind of figuring out my role, but it seems to involve uh, you know corporate strategy quite a bit more than I was expecting, and I'm used to. From my previous mm -hmm. roles i mean at ska my job is basically just to do whatever i'm asked to do and, and make a thing you know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so but i mean i guess i'm responsible for ska's strategy so you've uh, done it <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah that's true so it's, it's kind of proven to be an interesting challenge um and I mean, yeah, my, my boss is, is the CEO of the company. And so that's who I have been reporting to and who's been asking me to do all this stuff. Mm. It's, it's interesting. A new experience. Yeah. Yep. That's what we strive for. Amen to that. One of the, uh, one of the hallmarks of, um, the automation company that I worked for it was a, a custom machine design builder and very much like what you just said, it, it was, you do kind of what you're told you, you execute on the project that a customer comes to you with. And <clears throat> one of the reasons that I wanted to go from that into something that looked a little bit more like product development was that, you have the opportunity to be more a part of a team with a unified goal and mission, I think, in a, in a product company than you do in a, like, contractor for hire company. Yeah. So, yeah, I had opportunities recently to, to rejoin companies like that doing – contract work doing consulting and it's fun the projects are always different like the work was really 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 good but being part of a, a team with with like high energy aiming at something 
it is, I don't know, for me, made a huge difference. That's awesome. I like both. I'll be honest. Like I, um, I enjoy the service model because I feel like you get to rest a little bit and you're not as invested in the success of the product, which is nice when you've seen dozens of product companies that you've been in go under <laughs> mm -hmm. just following the step, which it has, you know, I mean, that's been part of my career. I mean, well, I mean it, at SK, I probably advised like over a hundred product companies and I saw, I mean, what is it? 95% of product companies fail that are funded. So in the first five years, I think is the stat. I mean, if I, I could be wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure that's it. And so, I mean, you know, you, you see that play out, you build a relationship and you, uh, you know, you get to know a client and, and you prove your worth and you do good work for them and you build trust. And then they run out of money and they can't afford to hire you anymore. And that happens over and over and over again, like Sisyphus, you know, and, and that can be somewhat Brutal. disheartening. Um, and it, it can also make you a little bit cynical about being in a product company. Uh, sure. And so it's nice to kind of be able to be on the sidelines, you know, a little bit and, you know, just get to work on the challenges without the risk. But then on the other hand, and now that I'm in a product company, mm -hmm. um, it's it's really fun to be working with a company that I believe in that's managed to penetrate even my cynicism <clears throat> and you know, get me to think like, you know, yeah, this is probably going to work out pretty nicely because, I mean, we've got a great team. We're working toward meaningful goals. Um, you know, I mean, I just some of the smartest people I've ever worked with, and I've worked with some pretty smart people, as you know. And so, I mean, it's... Uh, yeah, I, I can see either side of that of that coin. Like I, I like them both in sure. different ways, and I don't like them both Very in different ways. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, at one point during my my last experience, was convinced that like I never wanted to do product anything ever again. I think we probably talked about this. Uh, the last time I was on your show was just about a year ago. Yeah. Um, and I you were was the first lamenting. <laughs> Number one. Number one was an honor. It still is. Absolutely. Uh, For me I too. Was, a lot I of people have said a lot of good things about that episode. But anyway. <laughs> I, that's good to hear. Uh, hopefully this one has enough like meaningful content in it to, 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 to evoke the same reaction. Yeah, I hope so too. Um, <laughs> so I, I was, I was really bummed because it felt like we were not able to actually engineer anything. I, I really, I felt like product development was spending a lot of time talking about doing things almost as long as you could possibly get away with before actually doing things. <laughs> and then finally, when push comes to shove, you have to really, really scramble and like finally engineer the thing and do the thing. And I remember you couldn't use an automation direct PLC. You had to use an Arduino. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so time, time gives perspective on everything. And, yep. you know, I maintain what I said then which is like there are applications for both and we we use arduinos and raspberry pis all the time in evaluating our system and and collecting sensor data and and things like that they're really really useful for quickly quickly whipping something up that does a thing yeah for sure um but for reliability testing you, know, you absolutely want something more reliable but a world about it, the plc I, at form logic <laughs> oh yeah, right. You 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 have to be because it has to work. I mean, we're running three hundred thousand dollar to seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar or more machine tools, you know, and you don't want to mm -hmm. crash that <laughs> like expensive mm -hmm. robots. And, exactly. And, you know, it's it's not exactly. it's not worth it. <laughs> you, know, you don't want to cheap out on your electronics and end up breaking a super duper nice piece of equipment. Yep. It's all about risk management and, and reliability. 
So if you're doing reliability testing, as we are probably going to do in about a year or so, you really want to do it, it right now with on, something on that's a new robot we're commissioning. Reliable. Yeah, oh, that's good. Yeah, getting a getting a sense of accelerated timelines or just well, maybe maybe not reliability it testing. We're burning it in, so we're running it through the same cycle, like for multiple days on end, to kind of mm -hmm. see what breaks and then be able to address it. Mm -hmm. Does that count, it's, or is that a different I mean, thing? it's related at least um that's pretty much what we're going to do uh when we our, our instrument's going to eventually have like a three-axis gantry and a two-axis uh secondary motion mechanism and some other actuations nice we're gonna have to put the thing through its paces like we're gonna have to run it <clears throat> a lot <laughs> yeah this is a four-axis robot <laughs> yep exactly um but I, I bring this up because product development can take on a lot of different forms and right now we are in kind of a similar phase to the phase that frustrated me at my last company interesting um <clears throat> where the product itself is not particularly well defined. We are questioning our assumptions. We are trying to understand the market better. We are we are really trying to make sure that we build the right thing. But the difference here is that there is really innovative and challenging technology that we are developing that needs to be iterated. It needs to be iterated quickly. It needs to be de-risked and debugged. And we are very, very busy with actual engineering, trying to figure things out and actually make it work. And I think for me, that's the difference between enjoying this part of the process and not. <clears throat> so I, I wouldn't say at this point that like all product development is inherently evil or, or one way or the other uh, in terms of being something you enjoy. Um, but it, it, it kind of all comes down to what the company is doing and whether the product itself stimulates you. Yeah, makes sense. So even though you're having to chase kind of a moving target, it's more fulfilling because the product is interesting. That's, I think, what you're saying. Yeah, to some extent. To some extent. And, and part of it also is like I am provided a lot of visibility into the definition of the target. Oh, that's helpful. Uh, which I appreciate. Um, and in some sense, I help to define the target. Um, nice. So it's, uh, it's, it's tough because like I, I try to balance being involved in, in having insight and having input with like, negative feelings I have towards power seeking. Uh, and it's, it's a tricky line sometimes to try and make sure that what I'm doing really is effective uh, and, and like fills a gap that actively exists and isn't just kind of like, you know, uh, wanting a seat at the table for the sake of having a seat at the table. Yeah, makes sense. Um, which kind of comes back to somewhere where near where we started this, which was like humility, right? It's like you step away when it's appropriate and step in when it's appropriate and do the thing that is most helpful and most effective. Yeah, um, for sure. I mean, that, that kind of goes at what I was talking about about stoicism as well, which is sometimes you don't want to necessarily have those heavy decisions weighing on you, but you're needed. And so you do it anyway. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I've gone through phases, I think, especially early in my career where I, I definitely just wanted a seat at the table for the sake of having a seat at the table. 
and at this point, I mean, I've, I've had that enough where, you know, I feel like, I mean, I, I enjoy it. I mean, if it's, if I'm contributing something, I mean, if I'm not, it feels superfluous and stupid. Like there's an organization that I've volunteered with recently. Um, and I won't say which one, but every time I go to a meeting, it seems like they don't really have a defined agenda or a purpose or a goal. Um, but I'm in this esteemed position and I've allowed it to go on, but it, it feels kind of stupid. And so, <laughs> and I've talked to other board members on this or, and, and they're like, yeah, what the, the hell is this? You know? and so I'm not mm -hmm. the only one that feels that way. Um, but at the same time, uh, like, I don't know. I mean, it's, that feels like one where maybe I'm not needed at the table, you know, I don't think it's, it's important for me to be yeah. there. At the list, thank it for its service and send it on its way. Do yeah. the Marie Kondo with your time. I mean, the, the thing is, it just doesn't eat up enough of my time that I care enough to quit. It, it's such a low time investment. I don't really understand why they're doing this. Like why they have people like me just kind of named, but not really doing anything. Uh, if you, if you like seed ideas and that can be all it takes, like having a voice of reason, having a, a source of ideas of inspiration, like that can be really valuable. Well, I mean, I've, I've tried to do that with this organization and every time I, I give honest feedback, you know, they're kind of like, well, we'll take it under advisement and then, and then they don't. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Then it's a little confusing. Sure. 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 Yeah. I'll tell you after what it is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, volunteer is a weird thing. Like I, I write for a, um, a progressive metal like cool. review album review blog. I do album reviews and awesome. on occasion we'll have conversations about the blog and about like organization and, and structure and management. And it's gotten better recently, but the first couple were definitely like, aimless three-hour conversations <laughs> that were really like a struggle to sit through and I, everybody knew it but it was just like oh why are we and, doing and, this and, right it was it was kind of clear that like the and i I'm, I'm certainly not part of the leadership of this blog um i i don't want that uh responsibility necessarily because i don't have the bandwidth for it but it was fairly clear that like the leadership of the blog didn't come from a particularly like demanding corporate culture where you need <laughs> defined agendas and you like, it, it's, I mean, it's, it's progressive it's metal very, blog. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And it kind of makes you realize like the culture that we exist in, in high velocity companies. Yep is very much taught and is not necessarily second nature. Oh, that's interesting. And yeah, I could see that. Is not immediately obvious to just like the average layperson. Yeah. Which I feel like I see this whenever somebody that isn't used to writing contracts, like tries to write a legal contract and, and you see it. Mm -hmm the language doesn't really hold any water. Like if it were to go to court, cause they don't think about it that way. They're just thinking about it more common sense and off mm -hmm. the cuff. And I mean, I, I don't know. My mom was a corporate litigator like since the seventies and has given me a lot of free advice. I am not a lawyer, but I, in my capacity <laughs> of running SKA have looked at a lot of contracts and I've done it for form logic as well in a limited capacity um, and I'm sure I will continue to in my career uh, be a bit of a jailhouse mm -hmm. lawyer and so um, I don't know I mean some of, some of these people that are, are just total amateurs to that will, will come in and, and write stuff that makes no sense at all or they'll 
say one thing, then they'll forget what they said and they'll write something totally different into a contract. Or they'll take a boilerplate that has nothing to do with what they said and they'll incorporate that into their contract and then it feels like bad faith, but really it's just laziness and you find that out when you talk to them. And I don't know, there's a lot yeah. of different... Yeah, that's interesting to think about. I feel like there's some parallels there. Contracts are tough. I mean, I, I gotta be honest, like, I am trying to get a master service agreement signed with a consulting company that does electrical engineering consulting. They're great. Their their electrical engineer is, is who has done most of the work with us has been fantastic and they've actually gone ahead and like started doing work with us ahead of signing all this. Really trying to be accommodating. But getting the agreement signed has been like a month and a half of back and forth with our two not legal that bad. team. And like, it's just, you don't necessarily think about that when all you're doing is engineering the thing, right? Like contracts and this kind of thing, this is a new dimension to, to my career. Yeah. I, I've seen I know, it a month and a half actually, but haven't on driven the it. Side, but yeah. Yeah. I, I expected two weeks. Six, two weeks um, is normal. Six months is like the longer end of it. A month and a half is like getting to be tired. And you've probably yeah. spent like thirty grand each, I would assume, at that point, maybe. Um, you know, on lawyers, right. feels about right. I yeah. mean, I'm shooting from the hip here. <laughs> I mean, I've read, I've read through it. It's it's not particularly onerous. I, I think there's just a few thorny bits that like we're disagreeing on, and they need to hash out. But uh, it's Are you part of the it's negotiation. Made me appreciate. No, oh. no, I have no business being there. <laughs> I was gonna, <laughs> thankfully, offer friendly advice, but no worries. Oh, appreciate it, appreciate it. Uh, but it, it makes me appreciate that I am not part of the legal profession, and that you know my role is engineering, and that's 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 where it's in. <laughs> that's fine. I I can take that. Yeah, it's interesting because at Form Logic, I've had the luxury of being somewhat disinvolved from like legal and clerical and and doing the books which is all stuff that i was responsible for at ska i bet that's refreshing it's at times i feel like i'm kind of like missing it's weird because it's hard to break the want to do all the things like it, it's hard to get out of owner brain mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so on the one hand you know i i, I have been offering on our Slack channels at FormLogic to help our bookkeeper like integrate our expense reporting software. Cause I'm like, I've integrated that software before. Let me help you. <laughs> <laughs> and on the other hand, I mean, my bandwidth is also limited, so I probably shouldn't be doing yeah. that. And so, right. And, and you gotta walk that line carefully so you don't come across as assuming that they don't know what they're doing. Of course. Yeah. <clears throat> And I'm hoping I don't come off that way because I don't. That's not how I feel. I mean, I just want to be right, helpful. Right, of course. You just want to be helpful. Yeah. Um, one of the big differentiators, and I, I kind of wish we had we had touched on this a lot earlier in our conversation, but one of the big differentiators between this job and my last job was kind of professional and mindset growth relating to people um my my fiance and i both took a uh a psychology of leadership course an online course oh, through cool. cornell it was fantastic it was really it, it's hard to i'm going to go on a tiny tangent here but it's it's hard to assign value to hearing explicit articulation of something that you kind of subconsciously know. And, and a lot of psychology tends to be kind of like that, where you, you kind of know that certain things make you feel a certain way and make other people feel a certain way. And like you, you kind of navigate the world with some understanding of people and yourself. 
but when you hear certain things just like clearly articulated it adds a lot of value having that clarity in in terms of how you, most people respond to stuff um and so anyway i i i went through this class and really appreciated everything that we learned and my sister also has gone back to school for a master's degree in psychology and the difference between me today and me like two years ago is kind of this influx of information knowledge and interest in other people and in psychology generally to you know understand myself and understand other people that's awesome and i wish i had done this a lot earlier like this I probably would have navigated things at my last job a lot differently if I had the the kind of the plan, the strategy, the you know understanding of people and demeanor and like you know you you get more mature, you grow up as as yeah you I, I go think through certain situations, right. Uh, despite being children at heart, which we've already <laughs> talked about, you know, like there is there is a professionalism that has to happen in order to succeed at your career, right? For sure, yeah. Um, and so, in this new role, like I, I kind of set out a framework that I wanted to follow in in terms of my interpersonal relationships and how I wanted to comport myself and how I wanted to. Uh, like lead right it's you you want to really you know every job is a is a fresh start um and sometimes that lets you plan better and and kind of like lay out a vision for yourself that you it, it's up to you to fulfill but um if you can clearly articulate things it goes a long way yeah. so i i've been really really excited uh <clears throat> to put some of those learnings to the test and you know that's that's kind of what i look back on with a little bit of regret at, at my last my last job is like i didn't have the wherewithal to like treat interpersonal relationships as kind of the most important thing. Yeah, it definitely is. I mean, have you read Dale Carnegie's how to win friends and influence people? I know of it, but I haven't read it. It based the premise is what you're saying. I mean, sure, sure. There's a, a lot of, media out there to consume on this kind of thing and i mean we got here because you know you mentioned like offering to help right yeah um offering to help feels like it comes from a really really natural and genuinely like positive place but it can it can be fraught which is like the craziest thing. Like, I'm just trying to help. Like, why is this so complicated and difficult and confusing? And like, understanding psychology makes that so much easier to go about it, like in a, in a really, in a way that, makes it well received and, and eliminates conflict and like kind of does it the, the right way. If I, if I give it close. Yeah. Um, so this is stuff that I never would have thought about like a year or two ago. Right. It's, it's so top of mind for me now that like uh, almost more important than engineering skill itself in, in my book right now is, is like 
how you engage with other people and make them feel really. Yeah. I mean, you can't do a whole lot as a single person. If you have the respect and cooperation of your peers, you can be a lot more effective. Yeah. Going one step above and beyond that, that was like lesson number one in the psychology course. Can't do it alone. But you also can't do it if anybody in your circle is a detractor, is a negative, is somebody who won't like won't help you if anybody like one one person is enough to collapse your plan if you were like you know trying to gain buy-in and, and and accomplish something with a with a group of people in a professional setting right interesting so i i, I think of toxic personalities in a project a lot which is somebody that's just relentlessly negative and cynical and really? shuts everything down. Um, but when you talk about a dissenter, I think about somebody that is strategically trying to shoot down a plan as opposed to somebody that's just, you know, thinks it can't be done. Well, no, this isn't, it's not even necessarily technical. It's just like, I think the word that was used was detractor. Sorry. Detractor. And, uh, it was in relation to your support network. If you are trying to get something done, you have a support network. You have a bunch of people that are going to be positive and like encourage you and support you and allow you to do what you're trying to do. There's going to be some people that are neutral. They kind of have no, they, they don't lean the hard one way or the other. Neutral people are okay. Um, they won't stand in your way. But one person trying to stand in your way will bring the entire thing down. So your interpersonal relationships and like ensuring that you don't allow anybody in your circle to become a detractor is crucial to having no one like trying to sabotage you or stand in your way. That's interesting. Well, so how do you deal with that? Like, what's what's your strategy? I, I can say some of mine, but I want to hear yours first. Good question. Um, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is just, like, thoughtfulness and empathy. Uh, I am kind of cheating here because my fiancé is perhaps the most thoughtful and empathetic person that I've ever met in my life. Oh, so I, I have a good coach. Yeah. <laughs> I have a good coach at home. Um, I like her a lot. But it makes a really, really big difference to consider like other people's feelings before you do things or say things or ask things or, you know, if you reflect on a on a situation that you didn't necessarily have control of uh you can kind of also help guide things back that way and just generally being sensitive and aware yeah yeah i you agree know, that's kind of all it, all it is is being aware and caring yeah it makes sense to me i mean i would also say um so I have, I have a buddy that works for a, an organization and this buddy was telling me about um, a person that came to that organization. I'm being very, very vague. So Bye. this person came in and their whole job that they've had for 30 years is managing an out of date database. And, you know, it, it doesn't need to exist anymore. Uh, it probably should be gotten rid of. And my friend said as much. And this person understandably got really defensive because their whole job depends on the existence of this database. And they had yeah. allies and they were dug in. And, you know, they <laughs> basically um, ended up reaching a compromise where, like, they kept the database, but only for certain functions. 
and the way they did that is you know they all had lunch together and just talked about it and but i don't know i mean the, the, you get these interesting situations um i had one in the past where i was talking to um someone at a job and i mean we just got off to a rocky start like i um was fighting with them over some resources that I wanted. Uh, I, I needed some work done and, and they controlled certain resources and, you know, I needed them and, it was, you know, it's like Catan. Catan? Settler of the Catan. <laughs> Fighting over resources. You control the ore and I needed to build my city. Anyway. I, I meant human resources. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, that's funny um but yeah i just i ended up taking this person out to lunch and and we just talked about it and after that you know we it just was a lot smoother to work with them mm -hmm. um and i used the example from my friend at this organization of just you know reaching a compromise you know it's not the same as what you're talking about which is you know considering the stakeholders beforehand this is more of a reactive approach but i mean you know they if, kind of go if you hand. are if you are perceptive enough to pick up on the tiny tiny cues that people give you in the first like few milliseconds of their reaction that is their honest reaction they can mask all they want afterwards but if you catch as you were speaking, the very first like facial twitches like that tells you everything. And you can, you can do a huge amount of repair work by acknowledging what they haven't said and what they instead like tried to cover up. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I agree. <clears throat> And I mean, I don't know. And there's just a lot to be said for kind of maintaining a culture of open dialogue. So, you know, yeah. being able to talk about it when you don't necessarily see eye to eye with somebody at first, but, you know, maybe you can, mm -hmm. you know, come to some sort of arrangement if you both, you know, just are adults about it. So I feel like that's that's pretty powerful. Right. Compromise. It's, it's that psychological safety right? It's, it's being able to be humble and admit when you're wrong. It's being, it's, it's all the things that we've talked about. So far. yeah, no, one of my favorite things to say these days is I'm sorry, because it's free. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, makes the other person feel better. Yeah. So yeah, not very much a like engineering or robotics kind of conversation, but you know, this is, this is where my head's at right now is yeah. like very much in the, the psychology of things. I mean, and this it, is adult it's stuff. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's so interesting. It's, it's, you don't necessarily learn it in engineering school. You don't learn it explicitly unless you, you don't it learn out. it in business and, school either. I, I went to school for business and engineering double degree and not to talk shit on my, my schooling, but I, I will say business school is rather useless. And uh, so I will talk shit on my school lane. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I don't know, like actually being in business is, is pretty educational, I think. And so mm -hmm. yeah. what you said is true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the best salespeople are the best psychologists. Yeah, and they don't teach sales in school. Like I don't know of a single program that teaches that. Great. Learning about people's interesting, but also like really, really important to uh, working with them. Yeah. And having them support you and help you out. Yeah, I agree. I feel like we're at we're at a good stopping point. Should we should we call yeah. it? Probably. Is I there... think that I think that makes sense. That was that was conclusive. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah I felt, nice, felt clean... like oh. Yeah, it's all good. I mean, you know, we could talk for hours. It's, it's easy, well, of course. But... I mean, I love you, and we've known each other for years. 
That's the that's the deal. The deal, right back at you. Thanks, buddy. So what uh is there anything you want to plug? Up, yeah. Should we should we talk about Gralagor? <laughs> we can talk about Gralagor. <laughs> I have shirts. I have shirts in my closet. Do you actually? Um, I can have a my Gralagor grandmother shirt? made me shirts. She made a batch of t-shirts with the Gralagor logo That's on. That's awesome. Them. <laughs> oh it's great i haven't i haven't told any of them but like i'll buy I, one i recorded yeah i'll send you a link <laughs> yeah, uh i thanks. recorded an album uh two years ago or so mixed it myself and like finally got it out uh in october of last year it's a little half hour ep of uh i don't know complex sludgy i call it swampy uh black and death metal <laughs> um it's got a lot of saxophone in it which is kind of unique it tells the story of an omnipotent frog overlord that like <laughs> <laughs> murders people in the swamp it's, it's really out there stuff it's it's, it's wild i like it um, a lot the the thing is like i have never promoted it like as as me with my name because i know just how absurd it is so i, I kept it anonymous in the, in the album notes it's like just the letter d like d everything everything guitar bass drum mixing, saxophone vocals like um a little label a canadian label called not music picked it up and nice. released it on cd that's awesome so uh yeah actually hold on i have one i have one right here it looks like this. That's awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, we we did a run of a hundred CDs. Um, nice. They're they're very affordable. You can actually get one for free if you want to. Not music is a uh, distribution first label. They just want to make music accessible, which I thought was pretty cool. I'm not like trying to make money off this or anything. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Fine. Um, is there is there a Gralagor. website people can go to to get this if we're if we're gonna promote it like this? Sure. So Gralagor, Gralagor is a fun word. G R A L A G H O R R. Gralagor. Um, Bandcamp. Oh, oh, this is a sad. Thing. We should probably talk about this. Uh, uh totally totally unrelated to engineering totally unrelated to career and psychology <laughs> uh, we are on a wild tangent band camp has long been the place for supporting musicians you can buy digital albums and all their merch each artist or sometimes a label runs a page it's a very simplistic page for the releases of said artist and so it's, it's got a really nice clean unadulterated format no ads just nice bandcamp makes money only when fans buy things from musicians so they take a 10 to 15% cut, which means that they're encouraged to promote all of the content, all of the art, all of the music on their website and, and really like support the musicians in a way that, you know, famously nowadays, Spotify really hasn't been doing paying fractions of a penny per stream and like, screwing artists out of all kinds of revenue. Like it's, it's, it's gotten really ugly. Bandcamp has been this pure bastion of goodness in, nice. in the music industry. And fans have profiles. They collect music. They create collections. They have the opportunity to write little blurbs about the albums in their collection. So if you go to a popular album, you can read through like, commentary on the album oh, cool. like little mini reviews and see how many people and who have have purchased this album that's awesome um really really good and it just got purchased by epic games what does epic games do interesting they're a they're a largely video game company they own fortnite okay for example 
I haven't played um, video games in many years, so maybe I'm just kind of out of this totally world. Totally fair. Uh, so that, that bit's kind of irrelevant. The interesting part is that a Chinese internet company called Tencent owns a 40% stake in Epic Games. They also own nearly a 10% stake in Spotify. They're the third largest investor in Spotify. And they have stakes in Universal Music Group and Warner Music Group. Interesting. So two major, major labels. So Bandcamp, this independent, and, and the beauty of Bandcamp is that you can be an independent artist with no label and build a fan base, direct them to your Bandcamp, and they'll buy your music and support you. And there's, you know, you can do this completely independently and successfully. Awesome. Yes, but they just sold out to Epic Games. And so I don't know what this means for the future of Bandcamp, uh, but I'm I'm personally really apprehensive. I'm, I'm really kind of sad and nervous about it. I, I hope that nothing changes, but we'll see. Uh, Bandcamp has said that they're... Fridays, Bandcamp Fridays will still happen, which is um, every, I think, first Friday of every month, they donate all revenue to the artists directly. So the artists get 100% of the revenue from those days. Oh, cool. So they don't, they don't even take their cut, right? They did this at the start of the pandemic to support musicians because it's been <laughs> rather hard for musicians to get through this whole Brutal. ordeal. Concerts stopped for like a year and a half. Yeah, That's the primary yeah, means by which artists get revenue. Yeah, yeah, these days. But for sure. in any case, um, yeah. So we'll see how that goes. I'm, I'm, I'm a little nervous. Uh, but understand. You can find Growligor <laughs> on Bandcamp, which is why that came up. So uh, yeah, Growligor, We 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 will put a link in the description. Sorry. That too, that too. That's a good idea. G R A L A G H O R R dot bandcamp dot com. Listen to some squawky, sexy swamp metal. You heard it here first. Gralagor dot bandcamp dot com. Squawky, sexy yeah. swamp metal about an omnipotent frog that murders people. That's right. That's With right. Lots and they, of they sex. get reborn, so it's not just murder, but. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome, man. Uh, well, hey, thanks for coming pleasure, on. Always a pleasure, Dan. If you stuck around this long and you like what you've heard, please give us a like and smash that subscribe button. Or smash that like button and give us a subscribe. But we're always looking for new and interesting people to have on the show. If you know anyone good, send an email to podcast at ska.solutions or leave a comment below. Thanks again for listening and please come to the next one.